So I'm not a really typical data person, and I work at an agency called RGA, where we develop sort of products, services, and communications. Um, so basically, what I wanted to look at is this idea of data daddying and sort of da versus data empowerment. Um, so I thought that I'd start with a funny question, which is, what do you think the Wizard of Oz, Groundhog Day, Heineken, and Nike have in common, sort of, basically, with data? Um, and so I think the answer is actually in smart cities. So smart cities, as we know, are kind of a very hot topic at the moment. And we, if we look at it, it's the whole idea that I think in Asia, they've been created as sort of antithesis to chaotic cities. We're trying to solve the problems of overpopulation. And the way, obviously, we know this works is we have sort of sensors that are sitting inside, like on tops of buildings and environments. And as well as that, with the ubiquity of smart devices and smartphones, we're able to crowdsource that data as well. And we crunch all of it we should be able to actually manage and sort of streamline a city and all the logistics and distribution of it in real time. And I think the thought, um, one of the best examples of this is actually Songdo, the picture over here from South Korea. And Songdo is being hailed as one of the world's sort of smartest cities around. And the reason for this is because it's sort of taken it to like a much higher level. So examples of what Songdo has tried to implement are this idea of sort of a national smart security card. And so if everybody has a smart security card, the idea is I should be able to unlock my door with it. I should be able to sort of use a bicycle with it, buy movie passes with it, and do everything in my day. And the idea is that this can be an anonymous pass. So if I lose it, I can automatically get a brand new one. And then I can change all the key locks and passwords on it. And other interesting systems that they've put in place using data include things like we don't need garbage trucks anymore. So Songdo actually manages to take all your rubbish, push it through pipes that sit underneath your houses, clean it all up and take the waste, and the energy gets right back into the city grid from it. And it's also thought of things like sort of, I guess, like reward programs and gamification. So RFID technology to help people recycle. So if I put a bottle in the bottle bank, I should be able to get some reward or some credit out of it using the RFID tech. So Another example I think of a great smart city is this idea between IBM smart cities and Rio de Janeiro. What they've done is slightly different. They've looked at this as a, as a very chaotic city that they need to manage. So it's not a from scratch city the way Songdo is. And what they've done with um, this one is they actually have a data mission control room. So what you see here is sort of 80 meters worth of live video feeds that come from 900 cameras being dotted around the city. And you've got data analysts kind of in real time, like a war room, taking all of this and understanding it. And they've found interesting programs to implement through this. So for example, they look at weather patterns and they're able to sort of figure out from that when there's a flood that's gonna hit a favela, let the citizens know and sort of save lives that way. And they've even taken it up a tier higher, which is that it can affect legislation as well. So they found on certain highways due to traffic flow, motorists, for example, are, are at higher risk of hurting themselves. And so they've decided that maybe legislatively they'll ban motorists on those, on those areas. And so if we look at these kinds of cities, I think they're incredibly progressive, right? They've taken that model of a very static city and they've actually upgraded it, right? They kind of become living organisms now. We've got cognitive, smart, very responsive cities that we're working with. And I think that it seems like we've kind of solved the whole chaotic city problem in its entirety. But when you look at the black in black and white reality, I don't really think it really works that way, right? So if we look at this comparison, for example, we've got Seoul in Korea, that's actually the major city in Korea. It's full, it's vibrant, and on the right side, you've kind of got Songdo, which is the reality of what it really is today. They're really struggling to attract people to get to the city. Um, at the moment, they've got massive incentives going on to get people there, including bringing in, like, you know, sort of universities um, into the space, bringing in international schools, and they've even got massive tax breaks over years to get multinational corporations to set up house to kind of will people into the city with jobs. So that's really different when we look at the way cities actually organically grow and tend to attract people. This seems a lot more forced, right? And the same kind of thing I think happens with Rio. While I love the idea of sort of this real-time cabinet that can sit inside these data war rooms, crunch data, and maybe even make real-time decisions and policies for us that could save citizens' lives and sort of help out, I think the other part of it is it's still 900 cameras that are sitting outside in Rio de Janeiro, and large amounts of citizens probably unaware the, uh, the level sort of that this visual data is being crunched and how much they're actually human data points in part of a larger system. And so I think this is actually the true dilemma at the moment. 
that we have smart cities that are kind of becoming a little bit of the sort of what I would call data daddies, right? They're kind of becoming these, there's a risk that they overstep their boundaries and become these overbearing, kind of overprotective sort of parents of the people sitting inside them. Now, I know that's probably a controversial thing for me to say, perhaps out here or with the same core government, but the truth is I think we have to really think about the human component of this, right? We've got a lot of people coming to cities who I don't think are looking for that level of management. By default, cities attract people who are independent, who are entrepreneurial, who like to be a little bit autonomous, who like problem solving and challenges. Don't think that complete optimization and management is the only reason that they come to cities in the first place. And so I think that actually if we start to look at certain funny utopian models out there, and here's how I'm relating back to the first slide, that we could kind of see where some of this is going. So. If we look at the Wizard of Oz, for example, right? Wizard of Oz is all about these characters and they go to the Emerald City and they find out that the scary wizard is actually this little man behind some green curtains running an entire machine. Disappointing, maybe. And then we've got the island. I don't know if any of you have watched this, but the idea of the island is they've got all these clones and they're completely data controlled, right? But it's given to them as a, as a way to keep their lives at optimum levels. They take care of their well-being, tell them how much to exercise, what to eat, and they control every part of their lives. And what really happens in the island is these two guys cotton onto it and they start running away, basically. So why am I telling you these strange stories? It's because I actually think that those two scenarios tell us a little bit about the idea of data daddying. And these are the things I think we can learn from them. One is that, you know, to put it in a funny way, data that's sort of hidden and um, sort of put behind green curtains can be very, very unnerving. On the other side of the coin, complete optimization and control, even with the guise of, I think, perfect human existence, can get a little bit predictive and sort of mundane, right? And I think human beings by nature are sort of built a little bit to rebel against that because they want a lot. They look at life in terms of self-growth and in terms of discovery, and they want challenges and they want problem solving. And we have to consider that when we're actually building these kind of optimized cities. And so I think the solution actually lies maybe in this little film called Groundhog Day. So this is probably going to like tell me how old everybody in the audience is, because any 20-year-old is like, what is a Groundhog or a Groundhog Day? Um, but so, Bill Murray in Groundhog Day, what happens? It's kind of like the island. Every day is sort of the same. But the reason for that is not because there's some big brother actually optimizing everything for him. It's because he wakes up and every day is the same and he has a decision to make. He can either live the day the same way or he can learn from the mistakes of the day before and actually change and improve upon them, right? He's, got a he's in control of his behavior. And I think that that starts to get to really what we need to talk about in these situations was a data empowerment. I think the really rich space for big data to get into is the idea of moving from data daddying and this kind of control to data empowerment. But what does that actually mean when we start to break it down? I think that in one point, it's not about these kind of hidden things that ha happen behind green curtains. It's about the idea that data has to be made visible. And when it's visible, it also needs to be made understandable, I think, to the masses to have true impact. I also think that data needs to be made collaborative. And the way to kind of break this down a little bit is one, it could be sort of output input. So it's a feedback loop, right? I put something out there, people input, I adapt and I put it right back out there. The other way is it can be kind of made open source and collaborative, right? I mean, in the ultimate way, you kind of want it to be real time as well, because then you're again getting back into this contextual space. And in the last bit, I think that it has to be the idea of sort of, um, data kind of being made open source, right? And being sort of hackable to a certain point. And by that, I mean that, you know, you can have obviously software and APIs that are actually sort of hackable right up to hardware. And I think this is a really good example. So this is Chicago's The Array of Things. And the way that Chicago's Array of Things work, it's a compilation between the Open Set, uh, Center for Computational Data, the University of Chicago, and Chicago itself. And basically what's sort of happening is that in the array of things, you've got an entire city full of um, Fitbit sensors. If we could go back to the last slide, if that's okay. Um, so basically, we've kind of got a city full of sort of Fitbit sensors, basically. And uh, the way that it works is they measure temperature, they measure humidity, they measure sort of noise, light, and they even have Bluetooth modems inside that, that measure footfall and traffic. But the vast difference is it's completely open source. So I can scan these Fitbit sensors on the lamppost and get all the data feeding to my phone and then constantly update itself for me. 
but and what I think is even more interesting about it is it's one thing to take data and sort of open source it, but they make the hardware open source as well. So I can microprint a circuit board and connect it to the Arduino microcontrollers sitting inside these Fitbit sort of sensor posts. And I think the city's much more interested to see what their citizens come up with as opposed to their own. And I think that while this is obviously incredibly progressive, and I think that's really a new model for a city, I tend to, I'm thinking about these sorts of Fitbit sensors, and it makes me think of normal wearable technology that we all sort of sit and have on our hands. And there's a gap then, I think, between what Chicago is doing still and what we really need to have impact, which is the fact that the average person on the street, let's be super honest, does not really know much about printing circuit boards and connecting them to Arduino microcontrollers, probably. And if I'm an average citizen scanning this data and I'm getting all of it, it's really fun and it's really interesting to see all the temperature, the humidity and everything else, but I may not see the larger picture and the patterns and understand how I can utilize it or feedback about that to my government or to anyone else. And that's where I think we get the fourth part of data empowerment, which is the fact that data needs to be made emotional and motivational, right? Humans have to be part of these as integral sort of data points. And so ultimately what you need to do is have more human-centric user design. You need to make data visible in the sense that it has to be vernacular and it has to be understandable to the masses. And if it is understandable to masses, the advantage is that you've got people involved, you've got people engaged, and by default that means they're more motivated, they're probably going to actually use whatever you implement out there in the world more readily, and it's probably going to have long-term impact and effect, as opposed to something that's sitting behind walls. An example I want to give of this is what we do at RGA. So you might have all seen, it's an old example, it's a Nike fuel band, right? But it really changed things. It went from taking Nike from a product company to more of sort of a service and a tech data-driven technology company. And so just play a little bit about it. This is the Nike Plus fuel band, made to inspire anyone to be more active. It's the result of an intense two-year collaboration with our Nike client that tested the limits of every strategy, design, technology, and marketing capability at RGA. Nike knew it needed to break out of commodity categories like running shoes and find ways to play a larger role in the lives of consumers. They had a head start. With Nike Plus, Nike and RGA had devised a system to seamlessly transmit data from runners to a website and out to social networks. As Nike Plus became an obsession for over 7 million runners who share and compare results an average of three times a week, Nike was already looking ahead to a wearable device that could record, measure, and share all activity, powered by Nike Plus. With this insight that measurement equals motivation, how can we create an experience for the everyday athlete? We began with a story that explained what this new device could be and how it would stand out from every other product in the marketplace. Can you count, suckers? There was one word, one idea that summed it up. Everything you do counts. This would become the basis for the campaign that eventually introduced the device to the world. Meanwhile, we devised a process for managing the simultaneous development of the platform, the product, and its branding. We called this way of working vertical slicing. Our core team was small and nimble with cross-functional capabilities. On any given day, one group might be working on how the band syncs with mobile. Another group might be working on the unboxing experience. We tracked our progress on collaborative demo days with the Nike team. The product demos created a feedback loop, and working software became the measure of progress. Everyone could see where we stood, see where we had to go, and enter each new cycle of development with clear goals. Experimenting with algorithms, we began tracking every type of activity with a universal system of measurement called Fuel. Okay, so that video goes on a little bit. There's this idea that the key to Nike was that instead of, we had to look at it in terms of a user experience point of view, and so the easiest thing was everything counts, everyone can understand that, and everything's Fuel, right? It's energy, it's movement, it's motivational. Now here's another example, and I think this is um, really interesting as well. And this is urban mobility sort of in real time. And this is uh, the Singapore LTA and Helsinki that have basically real, like rolled out this idea that you should be able to route map and plan your journey in real time and have payment models where you can pay for them as you decide on that journey. And again, I think this is uh, looking at the idea of a living city. It's progressive as opposed to this typical sort of static sort of city sort of component. 
But what I think gets interesting about it is if we look at it, it's again really functional, right? It doesn't mean that people don't understand this, but they start to view, people don't actually move around a city totally to be functional. They move around it for certain purpose, they move around it for certain lifestyle purposes. And again, I think it gets really interesting when we start to fuse these two public and private sector spaces. So what people I think would like to know about cities too is what's happening at the moment, where it's going, what's and, and I think that can tie in with actual transport and optimization as well. So you have to put that emotional data element back into it. And while this may not seem like a typical place to align the two things, I want to show us something that we did with Heineken, which is this idea of using heat mapping in social media. And again, this is taking data, making it really visual and really easy for people to understand, and not just in that typical functional kind of a grid. <laughs> The key is, I think, to look at sort of this idea, as I said, of data empowerment. I think that's where the future sort of big data really lies in the fusion of public and private sector to really make cities work well. So it's the idea that data should be made visible, and by that it should be vernacular and understandable. It should be collaborative, and at best sort of open source, real time, all those aspects. It should be engaging. When it's more engaging and people are more involved, your solutions have a larger success rate and probably a longevity that you that we don't necessarily think of in terms of data all the time. And it should be emotional and should be motivational, right? It's kind of amazing what data can do and how it can behavior change and how it can really impact people from a small to a very large scale. And ultimately, this is where we have to move, right? From going from this sort of city interest and large sort of aspect to sort of citizen interest being tiny, it should be the opposite. If citizens are interested and they're engaged, cities are going to start to work better in the first place. At the moment, they kind of feel they're just running around like headless chickens, right? And this idea of sort of my data versus sort of big data has to, I think, change as well. And it has to kind of become a model more of our data, shared, collaborative, because we kind of own the environments that we live in sort of equally, um, even though that sounds a little bit, you know, abstract and hokey. And the last part is, I think, the parts that we discuss, like whether it's the Nike Fuel example maybe that we did internally, or it's Heineken, I think really what it's about is making everything personal, relevant, and ultimately cultural. That's what Songdo maybe lacks, and that's what some of these smart city plans really lack. Where's the aspect of culture and data? Because culture is really what draws people to cities, keeps them there, and you know, kind of makes them the amazing places that we all love and that we live in. So thank you very much. <laughs>